I don't know. I don't know where we sp we haven't decided where we're going to sit. So I'm going <laughs> to we should have figured that out, shouldn't we? Uh, well, hello everyone. This is very exciting, isn't it? And this is what they all look like in the flesh. By the way, you've already read all the bylines. Um, really pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for, for braving the weather and getting here. Uh, well, let's kick it off, shall we? Let's just get straight into it, shall we? Um, soft power, Molly. Uh, my understanding is it's coercive versus kind of good cop, bad cop sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. How, how would you kind of explain what it is? I think it's kind of most easily understood as sort of carrot versus stick. So the sort of traditional hard power, if you will, is things like military might, economic sanctions, the stuff that you can really force people to do what you want them to do, kind of on the international stage. And then there's this elusive concept of soft power, which has kind of always been around. Um, and it's sort of using your influence, using attraction to try and mold your global image or sort of spread your, um, your message or achieve your kind of diplomatic aims. Um, in some way, and sports has always been a part of that. You know, sports always been sort of integral to this mission and always been used because you can use it in so many different ways. Boycotting somebody, you know, boycotting a certain tournament is a way of saying we don't like what you're doing, um, and um, it can sort of keep open friendships. It can play out rivalries like those classic US USSR um, Olympics, um, and then you get into sports washing, which is kind of a big part of I think what we're going to talk about um, tonight, where you can use it to really re reshape your image, um, kind of on the global stage. Um, uh, um, Carl, Carl, we are. Britain is, we're the OGs, aren't we, of, of soft power? <laughs> <laughs> aren't we the originators of this, bringing football to the world and all that? Uh, I mean, Br Britain are the OGs of soft power. They're the OGs of, you know, the colonial power from the 19th century does all the bad stuff. Uh, a really good example of soft power. I'm very, very sorry. I'm about to talk about the BBC. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? But a good example of soft power is if you go into any hotel in the world uh, and you switch on the TV, you will find BBC News in some shape or form. The BBC spends a lot of money and a lot of very important, intelligent people do what they can to make sure the BBC is broadcastable everywhere in the world. So that means no matter where you are, you have some form of British government tinged Opinions. What? That's because it's a trusted source. It's, it's a trusted source, <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. The BBC is a trusted source, and you believe that because it's on every single channel and blah, 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 blah. That's like a, one of the oldest, more prevalent versions of soft power ever. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Is the, is the well, we've is got the to a really, really bad start. <laughs> <laughs> really Another bad. Another version of it. I talked to you. I just sat with him at Manchester United Another earlier. Another version of it is American soft power, <laughs> which brings us to the New York Times, my employer. No, um, <laughs> which is also like another prevalent thing, Pax Americana, the idea that the United States uh, is the bodyguard of the world since the Second World War and is the prevailed peace ever through the UN, blah, 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 blah. So these are things colonial, old, old colonial powers do to make sure you are aware of them and you are in some shape or form reliant on them. Now the newer versions of soft power, or the more overt versions of soft power you're seeing, again, it starts in I mean, we can talk about the 19, you know, the Hitler Olympics. We can talk about uh, the Rumble in the Jungle, the Throne in Malaya. Uh, Eddie Hearn is a very, very interesting man. He's clearly intelligent, but he says things in a very short, straightforward manner, which makes him seem stupid. Uh, but he said something recently about uh, AJ fighting in Saudi Arabia. Well, do you feel like finding complications about playing Saudi Arabia? He goes, no, this is boxing. Boxing goes where the money goes. Bo the history of boxing is the history of sports washing, uh, which he's right. Um, what was the question again? We, uh, Brit Britain, we were the ones we've yeah, we, of course, we've Britain been exhausted, all time. Ex <laughs> exerting soft power. I mean, just to just be, to be the one who indulges in what aboutery first or get in there first. Eight years ago, do you know who came to to Manchester? Xi Jinping. Yes. And um, he, he had a selfie with Sergio Aguero at the uh, the training ground where I was today. Uh, David Cameron met up with him. The Football Museum also mm -hmm. got involved, showed him the Jules Rimet. Uh, also in doc uh, put into the Hall of Fame, you know, where we've got Bobby Moore, Eric Cantona, George Best, Sunji Hai. Remember him? Did yeah. He? Yeah. Um, apparently for his work, you know, as a community person with the Chinese community and all the rest of it, but also just happens to be the first Chinese player to play in the Premier League. Why would they have done that, Adam? Well, I think at that time you had a really interesting thing going on with China, where China was, I suppose, talking about football in the way that Saudi Arabia is now talking about football. It was talking about, I think it was 2050 was the big aim for China, where Xi Jinping wanted 
to have, I think, probably an Olymp another Olympic Games there. They wanted to have a, a World Cup there. And there was this launch of a Chinese Super League um, that we now almost forget about it. But there was a huge level of investment, massive wages on offer, big transfer fees. Um, I think probably the pandemic has had a significant impact on China's interest in sport generally, um, in terms of the pace at which China came out of the pandemic uh, has changed that. I think even up until, I remember being in Qatar for the World Cup last year, and you had some pretty senior people at FIFA saying, we still think China might go for the 2030 World Cup. We still hold out hope mm. they might come in for 2034. And that's not happened in the end. So I think at that time, China was investing hugely in sport, but also Britain, and you'll be able to speak to this better, better than me as well, Britain at that time was kind of going down this road of engagement with China, mm. this road of thinking, well, if we involve them, we bring them into the economy, then we, then we can kind of bring them on that journey of human rights and normalization and everything like that. And I think that was the David Cameron approach to it. It's, it's an interesting thing in terms of the last few years when you look at uh, the big rounds around Huawei and um, uh, huge issues around the treatment of uh, Muslims in China at the moment as well. So all of those de debates are now happening. But back then, the view was we can bring Chinese money into the economy. And we also saw them investing in a huge number of English football clubs, Southampton, uh, Birmingham, uh, Wolves, West Ham, I think uh, West Brom. There was a, I think there was a view that if you bring them in, they seem to have a bit of excitement around HS. Remember HS2? Yeah, that, that, that was a good idea. <laughs> don't mention that up don't, here. Don't mention <laughs> But I think there was a bit of an idea around some of those areas that were going to benefit from HS2, the Chinese could invest in and, 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 and there would be mutual benefit to it. Mm. But that's kind of the classic counter argument to the yeah. concept of sports washing, you know, is that you can actually use sport and all of the values. And this is what FIFA has been speaking yeah. ab about a lot over the past few years to kind of bring people in. And it's like, you know, if there's a sort of badly behaved kid in school, you know, do you say you can't play football with us? until you sort out your behavior? Or do you try and integrate them in a way that they sort of change through playing? You know, th there is a sort of, I think, a fairly credible counterpoint, which I guess is what, what David Cameron and Co were making. Yeah, I think so. And I think there, was also, there is also a reality that, you know, one of the big criticisms, I suppose, of British government since maybe 2010 is the level of investment in local communities, mm -hmm. right? So people can, people, and we probably will speak a lot around Newcastle and, Saudi Arabia, but it's also a reality, the level of investment that was going into that area, that continues to go into that area, a lot of people in the Northeast feel is inadequate. In the same way as a lot of people will look at Abu Dhabi and what's happened in the areas around Manchester City Stadium and say, that investment wasn't coming. That investment wasn't coming. So sometimes I think there's a danger that we as sports fans think they're just grabbing a slice of what we want when actually Britain is often getting quite a lot in return for a bit of football. Um, Simon, I was at the uh, training ground for Manchester City today. It was lovely, I must admit, you know, and they, they've got really nice facilities there. Nobody chucked me out after the press conference with Pep Guardiola. They had free drinks, free food. It was great. I could have stayed there all day. Isn't um, what the UAE have done, or, you know, through the ownership there, isn't that the most successful model, therefore, of this exertion, exertion of soft power, the treble winners? I mean, yes, if, if that's how you see their investment, they would probably argue that they're diversifying their economy for such a time where oil and petrol is, is not uh, sustainable as a, a, a revenue generator. So they're making through Etihad, through Etihad Airlines, through uh, holidays to Abu Dhabi, they're opening up. Um, a, a kind of tourism area almost you know it's not that long ago that if you wanted to get to Australia um, or New Zealand from this part of the world you would go through Singapore or you would go through Malaysia now you tend to go through Dubai or, or Abu Dhabi far more so it, it, it depends on what you see the investment as being why you think that that actually exists and clearly that 
you have to also have a plan. We, we, we've all seen at Manchester City how that's worked. Now, there are 115 charges levelled against them to, to kind of argue that maybe when they first came in, they didn't adhere by, by the rules. But clearly, last season, they won the treble. Few would argue against them winning more trophies this year. But then when we go back to China, and you mentioned West Brom, West Brom are in a perilous state, really, financially, because for whatever reason, and we don't know why, but the Chinese government encouraged people to invest and then discouraged them. So you ended up in a situation at West Brom where they overreached themselves in terms of, of wages, and then there was not the money to sustain that level of investment, and now they're struggling to to pay all their bills into Milan are looking for new owners in Italy because they're in the same kind of situation. Wolves have managed just about to navigate their way through that. But Manchester City clearly have done things in a slightly different way, a slightly different dynamic, clearly different owners from a different part of the world. But it shows the kind of delicate nature of this soft power if that is what it is because you are you are at the kind of beck and call of the people who are who are deciding whether you're going to invest or not uh, and carl i know molly Wilk can give us more of the ins and outs on the real issues that that come through all of this but you know let's go you, you spend a lot of time looking at manchester united those fans would would a lot of them would welcome the qataris to do something similar that what manchester city has had done to them it's, it's a model situation, uh, and this is how you know soft power or sports work, washing works. It's because it, it, it puts a but, or a maybe, or a kind of, but it, it puts some sort of footnote in conversations that should mm. be much, much simpler. So uh, do a section of Manchester United fans, would they prefer having Qatari ownership than the Glazer ownership? Some of them do, and then you have to break down where about they live in the world, how many of them come to Manchester United, why they, th they think that, so you know, I've, we have many surveys on the website, we have you know, podcasts and whatever, and we have loads of people saying, I want Qatari to take over Manchester United because they have money. And because of the way other football clubs in the world operate, I now believe the only way to be successful in football is to have essentially an unlimited supply of money. That argument shows you that a form of soft power of sports washing works because now you've got a generation or a selection of football fans that believe only money is important. And you, you sometimes, you know, I'm, I, I'm in the pub and I overhear Manchester United fans say, oh, well, who cares? I just want to win games of football. There's a quote that often gets misattributed to Abraham Lincoln where it says, uh, a man will m most likely protect his interests rather than his rights. And I th that is the nugget of sports washing, is that football or any form of sport is meant to be the place you go to forget about the big wide problems of the world. And then certain individuals and or groups recognize the power of that and go, well, if I just buy a chunk of it, I will then get that se section of a fan base to think about me or think about my group in a very, very positive manner. So this is why, you know, a very, very obvious example of this was when Newcastle was bought, uh, they had to issue a statement politely asking some fans to not wear tea towels around their heads. It was that the very instant just they have bought a section of to be really mean about, you can say sycophants, right? You buy the ideas and the protection of a number of people to think you are very, very good. And you, know, this, you see this on very, very low level scales and mayors buying nice things for their cities to the very, very high things, which is, like Adam said, the amount of investment in the Manchester area in and around the Etihad. Now, I'm, when I first moved up here, I, I lived in Ancoats. So that area was not, I think my, my cab driver once told me, um, I don't have a cab driver, that was just a cab driver. He's <laughs> uh, doing very well at the yeah, Atlantic. <laughs> I'm doing A cab driver once put, you know, drove me back from Old Trafford back to my flat went during the lockdown seasons, and he was just pointing out, this used to be a, uh, a car park, this used to be a car mechanic, like none of this used to be flats. Uh, and now, due to the investment, all these people live here, all these people that also travel from London. Manchester itself has been dramatically changed by soft power. Soft power works when you're not thinking about it at all. It's, it's that very subtle shift in your mentality and it changes your behaviours and you, you go, well, I, I can't live without this. It's the, you know, who here has an Amazon Prime membership? Raise your hand. There you go. Right? That's a very, very soft form of, you, you are in an extent quite reliant on Jeff Bezos to live, unfortunately. <laughs> 
I'm just taking that in for a moment. I didn't <laughs> realise it was that bad. I was waiting um, for the taxi driver to turn up. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Bitman's around the corner. <laughs> Molly, taking all that into account, you've done a lot of work looking at the Qatari work with the workers in Qatar and the kafala system and, mm -hmm. and what's happened since then. For a Manchester United fan who's thinking, do you know what? I've just, we've just lost 3-0 to the treble winners. We can't have any more of this. That guy who's getting soaked every single home game when the roof leaks, he just doesn't want any more of this. He wants new investment. Why should they maybe take a step back and think maybe we shouldn't go in Qatar? Or at least if, you're, if they are mindful of, say, mm. the issues that are around it that go beyond towards human rights, for example. Yeah. Well, as a Manchester United fan, it is a sensitive time, and I am, <laughs> I am very aware of the arguments um, and potentially more susceptible um, than normal after recent results. Um, but I think... I think there is a, 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 a real concern there for lots of communities and lots of sort of human rights defenders in general. I think one of the things that's been most talked about um, with Qatar um, has been around the migrant workers. So because Qatar needed to scale up its kind of footballing infrastructure um, ahead of the World Cup, they brought in many thousands of, of workers from, um, from other countries. And some of them were being paid as little as one pound um, an hour. Um, we heard um, stories of people working 12-hour days for 30 days straight for not being, you know, not being paid for three months on the trot or being sort of dismissed with large portions of their pay. And I think in a way, the relationship between that and the football tournament goes beyond the kind of soft, gentle stuff that we're talking about. It's not just a way of saying, oh, don't look at that, you know, look at this. Also, I think the argument is you are in a way fueling this, you are in a way sort of funding this um, by giving them these projects, by creating the need for this there kind of labor. When Sepp Blatter was arrested, I want to say in 2015, mm -hmm. during the, the US, yeah. he was arrested and it was, he was sort of ejected from football. I remember talking to Heidi Blake, who worked for Sunday Times, saying, well, we, we knew what mm. Qatar would do and we, we knew that Qatar's plans for all those stadiums was dramatically unfeasible from 20, I want to say 2010. You know, Qatar was promising to have artificial clouds to block out the sun and keep things calm. And you're like, well, there's no way you can do that unless you have magic or an infinite supply of people. And what they went was, we'll have an infinite supply of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember Heidi Blake outlining essentially 2015 was approaching a, a threshold, which is, and it's, it feels awful to say, but several dozens of people had died building those stadiums. And those stadiums were in a position of partial completion. Uh, and you had a number of FIFA representatives and other individuals all sat in their hands going, well, do we just stop there and not finish mm. them? Because then those stadiums will have been built in vain of all these essentially bodies. Uh, and, and, you know, FIFA umd and ard and umd and ard and umd and ard and then decided, well, we'll just keep pushing more things into this millet and grindstone to build your stadium. So you're going, well, we should have stopped. We should have stopped before the bid was given. We should have stopped in 2015 when, when Sir Blatt was on. And this is how even calling it soft power isn't good enough because it's not soft, it's insidious. Mm. It's, it's, we always talk about things like discrete terms where soft power works like collar in water. So again, you all have Amazon Prime memberships. I'm sure you all use that Amazon Prime membership to watch the Premier League games at some point in time. And that's Amazon like, hey, look, we brought you the Premier League. Aren't we great? Don't worry about where we pay our taxes. Don't worry about why your public infrastructure in your city isn't doing well because we're not paying taxes on the big factory you've got in the center of town. It's that insidious, confusing way where you can't properly live your life. I think, I think the, the problem or the, the gray area, when we're talking about Qatar, and I heard this um, on the radio this morning, so clearly events in the Middle East are tragic for the people who are suffering on both sides and people will have their own views of what's happening there but at some point peace has got to be negotiated some settlement has got to be agreed to stop this and inevitably that will involve Qatar because Qatar are the ones who are close enough to Iran and close enough to America to pull this thing together. Now, you can argue the merits of their relationship with Qatar or otherwise, you can argue the merits of their relationship with America, but they will be absolutely crucial 
in deciding the peace situation there. And without them, it's possible that it will not happen. So then it will be acknowledged that Qatar have played a, an intrinsic role in stopping this humanitarian disaster. But then, if things had turned out differently, we could be saying at the same time, well, yeah, they've done that, but we can't let them own Manchester United. Yeah. And it's like the soft power argument is like there, it's clear. But where do we draw the line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable? And is the serious stuff, really, really serious stuff, okay? Or is the stuff that's not as serious, that's only football, is that not okay? okay and that's so, the difficulty. Yeah, so I suppose there's like, I suppose four or five different threads going on here at the same time. So I think that the interesting thing that, that you picked up on is what is Qatar's place in the world right now? And Qatar's place in the world has evolved, mm. I think, significantly over the past 10 to 12 years, partly as a result of some of the sporting things it's been able to produce, some of the investments it's been able to make, whether it's in Paris with PSG. Um, but when what happened to, to, towards the end of the World Cup was you had the Qatari Emir, who's the, the ruler of the country, basically sit down with a few of his sporting advisors and say, we need feet on the ground in the biggest league in the world, in the Premier League. And the person that, that got that message was Nasser al Khalifi, who was the president of Paris Saint-Germain. And that led to conversations with Tottenham. Um, it led them through all different structures, whether it was QSI, which owns PSG, or QIA, which is the overall sovereign wealth fund. Um, they looked at Liverpool. And then eventually, because of the rules around ownership, that you can't have realistically the same, the same person owning PSG and Manchester United, because they're going to be playing with each other, they're going to be selling players to each other very often. Qatar needed someone who was kind of significant enough but irrelevant enough. And that's where you get this guy, Sheikh Yassim. And look, I'd been at Qatar during the World Cup, spoke to a lot of people around Qatar for the past five, ten years. Nobody's ever mentioned this person, right? This isn't someone who... You know, <laughs> there aren't many people who just have six, you know, six billion in their pocket cash ready to go that we've not heard of. Sometimes it happens, but it's not common. Uh, so, as a result of that, at best, I think what could have been happening here is he's obviously the son of a former prime minister who had a huge amount of power in terms of the economy, in terms of investments at that time. And it could be that it was a family office project, but it would have had the approval of the state because no nothing that big happens in Qatar without the approval, without the sanctioning of the state. Or it was possible that it could also have just been Qatar decides to do this, and this is the entity we're going to use in order to do it. So in terms of what, what Simon's saying, in terms of Qatar's place in the world as this mediating force, as this force that can go between the USA and Iran, that's where it's really interesting. Because you also saw it with Russia, with Russia, Ukraine. They were pretty careful as well. With China, they're pretty careful. Um, and actually, when I speak to people who were involved in trying to buy Manchester United for Qatar, they don't, like, they're never going to say we're doing this to deflect from all the people who may have died building stadiums. Now, that might be a, a part of it, but a far bigger part of it is about Qatar's place in the world. It's far more about the fact that for four years in the lead up to the World Cup, you had a blockade in the Gulf region of Qatar. In the years leading up to that World Cup, where you had the, their neighbours, Saudi, UAE, Bahrain, all blockading them by land, by sea, and there was a real risk to the long-term security of Qatar. And they were disappointed by America. They were disappointed by Trump's America because they've got, a, they've got an air base in Qatar. They thought, we're on the same team, but Trump's going on Twitter and basically saying, I'm in support of this blockade. I'm on the Saudis' side with this. So Qatar were looking at ways in which they could leverage more power and owning one of the most prestigious sporting assets in the world in Manchester United was a way that they could do that. And just on your point around what's currently going on in the Middle East and Qatar, you know, I suppose you'd have some people saying, on the one hand, you have the political wing of 
terrorist organization, Hamas, basing itself in Doha. And on the other hand, they are still sufficiently trusted by the USA as a mediating, negotiating force. So I don't know if you can explain how they managed to sustain I those two positions. It baffles me. <laughs> Not one that I can add no. um, much uh, insider light to at least. But it is, it is really interesting. And, and you wonder, I guess, about sort of whether necessity has a part to play in this. You know, we were chatting about this before. You know, is there a difference between there is someone in a sort of singularly yeah. sort of useful position who can at this point, you know, save potentially thousands of yeah. lives versus we could give this tournament to any number of people. We are choosing to give it to you. I don't know if that potentially makes things different. It's the potentially, right? Sports washing deals in the potentially, deals mm. in the abstract, deals in the where do you draw the line, uh, deals in the who watches the watchman. Uh, this, the fun thing about being a football fan, uh, fun is in commas and fun is in weird, is that you at six or seven, eight years old go, oh, football, that's kind of fun. And then you learn a bit about cities in Europe because you start watching Champions League games, you start doing this. And now we're at this point in time where you kind of need to know what the Battle of Camel was about so you know how PSG interacts with Newcastle mm. and how that interacts with Manchester City and how all of those relationships work. And it's, it's very weird to be sat here as a football journalist having to have close to intimate knowledge about all of these large geopolitical situations. I think I'm not economic no, absolutely. references. And I, th I think the, the interesting thing mm. going back to um, Adam's point is the other reason I would have thought why Manchester United was so interested in Qatar after this blockade. Mm. Well, who was part of the blockade? <laughs> UAE was part of the yeah. blockade. Abu Dhabi was part. So you're basically parking your, your tanks on their lawn, basically, and saying, we're here as well. You can't ignore us. Yeah. And that is a, such a massive geopolitical issue that is, in one sense, nothing to do with Manchester and the roots in the Industrial Re Revolution and everything, but it is a, a, an issue now and was, could still maybe, who knows, end up right here. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's also, the thing we've not mentioned is when you're talking about a Qatar or a Saudi, you're talking about a country that at the moment is very rich, but it has, it has resources that are going to run out and therefore, when people talk about, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's just sports washing. Well, okay, it might be to an extent, but there is a reality here that they are going to run out of oil. They're going to run out of gas. All the fossil fuel stuff at some point may run out. I think, you know, get going off the way that targets seem to be changing, it may all last a bit longer than some people may hope, but they are also trying to prepare themselves to have a sustainable economy long term. And that's why all of a sudden you see Saudi talking about holidays by, the, you know, by mm -hmm. the sea, right? Because they need a tourism industry, they need a healthcare industry, they need investments in tech, in fint all the stuff that, you know, uh, AI, all of this stuff that every major progressive economy mm. is looking at, these countries are making investments in. You know, it's not like they're in ignoring everything else and thinking, oh, we'll just go and have a kickabout, yep. right, with the football. But this it's is also interesting to, sorry, um, it's also interesting to, I'm watching the Saudi Pro League develop and I'm seeing the numbers they're putting you're together. You're actually watching it? No, as in watching, <laughs> watching it. So I, I'm, I'm reading reports as to how much money is being spent on Neymar, how much money is being spent on Cristiano Ronaldo's wages. And that money has to be paid for by a fuel economy. And if you are of the disposition that we need to, to lower our carbon emissions and, and reach zero emissions by 2050, you cannot have Newcastle buying Kylian Mbappe for 250 million without the people in charge of that who sign that check going, we need to make sure people are still buying petrol cars because that's how we pay for it. <laughs> and it's that very, again, it's that very weird thing of, I watched the Neymar deal go through and going, is petrol ever going to, is the price of petrol ever going to go down ever again? Because the price of petrol now has to be sustained at a certain level because Neymar needs his party money, basically. <laughs> 
That's, I, I'll blame Neymar the next time. <laughs> well. That's what I'm taking from that. And Molly, you were going to come in there. I was that. just going to say, I think this is, we end up looping back here yeah. to the soft side because what we've talked about is their genuine need to have investments in a diverse range of um, products. Um, but also that is only linked by changing people's connotations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are more likely to go on holiday to Qatar if they have already been to go and watch a World Cup game or, or their mates went yeah. to go and watch the World Cup. You know, there's a degree of like holistic change, which is both very palpable in terms of money going in and out. And also this sort of long term psychological change, not only among fans and among potential consumers, but then that filters upwards to the sort of wider international community. So, so just go, going back to, you know, we're going to throw forward to, the, to Saudi Arabia. We're going to talk about Jordan Henderson as well, Adam. But just go back to the World Cup for a moment, right? One of the big things was, you know, they're going to reform. The things that we have issues with, Qatar are going to do. We mentioned Kafala as one of them. Mm. Has, ha, has there been long-lasting changes now? Depends who you ask. Um, when I asked Qatar about this, they said yes. When I asked uh, the Trade Union Congress, they said no. So sort of depends. Um, there were definitely reforms which were introduced in Qatar, specifically linked to the World Cup for sort of migrant workers' rights. And I think this is one of the arguments in favour of you know accepting people in and, um, and and giving these tournaments is that you know potentially some of the reforms to these systems would not have happened if the World Cup hadn't put the spotlight on at that moment. However, the question is, have any of them actually done anything? Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of testimony from um, migrant workers before the World Cup, just immediately before the tournament started, and then we went back afterwards and said, I think it was six months later, how are things now? Yeah. The answer was not that much different. You know, there were certain things that had been in brought in um, within Qatar, such as like a wage protection scheme to try and basically make sure that people got paid. Um, and they'd altered the kafala system, which um, is a system where you can't change jobs without your employer's position um, yeah. permission, which is a pretty nightmarish situation. And lots of people said that these things had been kind of quietly reinstated, that there was still a problem, for example, with um, employers seizing people's passports mm -hmm. or threatening them with deportation to stop them moving jobs. So yeah, technically you can do it, but we're gonna use all these reasons to stop you. So some of the reforms I think have been um, an improvement, but one um, worker in their testimony to us said, actually they preferred it when the spotlight was on. You know, right within that period where the international community was looking, things were better. And certainly, I think, to be fair, things have improved. Qatar says it now leads the region on, on labor rights. Um, but certainly, from what I've been told, things have slipped back. This is the history of every major international tournament, right? We, we Musuk Wonga wrote a fantastic piece talking to, to LGBT people in Russia over the 2018 World Cup, saying the World Cup was the one time where I could walk freely because the police were essentially paid to look the other way. We know that the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, drinking alcohol on match day in Brazil is, was illegal for years because of just the amount of fan violence going on. But one of the big sponsors for the World Cup is Budweiser. So Budweiser kind of put a nice burlap sack in front of certain politicians went, could you make sure people could drink Budweiser on match day? Th things got slightly happier, if didn't, depending didn't on who you talk to. Didn't work Yeah, <laughs> and then things get w widely revoked. I'm, I'm born in London, and I, every year I see people talk about how brilliant the London 2012 Olympics was and how the trains ran on time. But also people got fo more or less forcibly removed from their homes they, and re moved over to Hastings to make room for moneyed people in the Olympic Village. The Olympic Village was meant to be affordable housing for people in East London to move into later. And then a certain someone became mayor and went, nah, foreign investment instead. That's silly, silly man. Um, so this is again about the thing about Britain is also a perpetrator of soft power. And Britain sort of gave the handbook to a lot of these nations as to how to behave and how to operate. I think yeah, the, just, just I mean, sorry, Stephen, go No, I was, I was going to say the, the thing about Qatar, the, the alcohol, it's very interesting because we were led to believe that alcohol was going to be available and then just before the tournament yep. they decided it wasn't and there was the big Ferrari um, in Western Europe, USA, that this is not right. But then... Budweiser did or Budweiser did. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of women that I spoke to mm -hmm. said that actually they felt far safer in Qatar and it was a more pleasurable experience 
because alcohol wasn't freely available. So in that sense, are we imposing antisocial behaviours on someone and complaining that they won't accept them? <laughs> but do you not think, I mean, it was amazing how many people I spoke to in Qatar, as you say, from actually from the West who were saying things like, this is the safest I've ever felt around a World Cup because there's no boot drinking. But then also they were the same people heading up to the rooftop bars for a drink later in the, later in the evening, right? So I think there was a little bit of take with one, take with one hand. And I'm also cautious of sort of saying, we can't create a precedent where we're basically saying football fans can't go to tournaments and drink, right? Like, it would be ridiculous. That would, you know, unless it's a country that for very, very fair religious reasons has those laws. I think the issue with uh, alcohol in the first place there was that it shouldn't have been actually allowed in the first place to be a sponsor. If you're, if you're going to host a World Cup in a country that has legislation based on religious laws um, around alcohol, then why are you imposing Budweiser mm -hmm. on them in the first place? Um, but what I don't like is this idea that we can't trust any football fans to have a couple of beers if they want to. Have, if they want to. I yeah. think I think also y you raise the question there of, of who is comfortable and when, yeah. right? So some people might be more comfortable because of X law, but what about the fans from the LGBT yeah. plus community who were over in a place where, you know, they could have faced serious persecution for, you know, having a relationship, being who they were. It's like, I think it's hard to draw the line, really, on, on so what we say we're going to impose and, yeah. and what we're not. And also, I mean, one of the... We've spoken about migrant workers. We'll probably speak about LGBT issues. One of the... One of the most extraordinary things I saw in Qatar was actually the day that the USA played Iran in the group stage. And if you remember at that time, the Iranian, uh, Iranian protesters, um, Iranian women at that time were, were protesting against the regime in Iran and you had a lot of Iranians who, I suppose, live in the Iranian diaspora who came to, to the World Cup and they wanted to show their support for these protests. And you would have thought that a tournament that prides itself on inclusivity, on the rights of everyone involved, wouldn't have had an issue with t-shirts such as, you know, three women, right? Now, because of what we said earlier around that relationship between Qatar and Iran, actually what happened, there was a lot of f fighting after that game actually between different Iranian groups of supporters. And from what we saw as journalists that night, the Qatari police were taking the side of those who were having a go at the women the women who were protesting. Mm. And not only that, FIFA's complaints committee, grievance mechanism, got a load of complaints from female Iranian fans who thought they were basically being followed and monitored and having pictures taken of them by Iranian state spotters in World Cup stadiums. I mean, like really dark, sinister stuff going on at a World Cup. And actually, I think that was one of those things that, that FIFA got away with, to be honest, because mm. The way that that was allowed to happen and the way that, very similar to, you know, for years leading up to the World Cup, you had all these different um, leaders of the Qatari Supreme Committee uh, who were hosting the World Cup saying things like, oh, you can come with a rainbow flag, you're not going to have a problem. Then people turned up with rainbow flags, they're having to take off them. You had stories of people basically being strip searched down to their underwear if they had T-shirts on and things like that. And what we saw was FIFA lose control actually of their own stadiums at that tournament. And it was handed out, and it, basically the idea was keep politics out of football unless it's our politics, mm -hmm. right? So actually you saw a huge amount of support for Palestinian rights at that tournament, which loads of people across the world will agree with. Equally, there'll be loads of people across the world who agree with a rainbow flag. But what we saw in Qatar was the Qatari police basically and security services said, as long as we agree with whatever the cause is, you can do it. If not, forget it. Well, we are into injury time, actually, <laughs> in the first half, so uh, we won't go full VAR and add another 10 minutes <laughs> on. Uh, we've got lots more to talk about. I think we've got to, as you mentioned, the LGBT yeah. situation in Qatar. And then throw it forward to Saudi Arabia. We've got to talk about Jordan Henderson. Lots more to talk about, and we will be opening up to a Q&A at the end, so get thinking whilst we're having our half-time oranges and Jaffa cakes, and we'll see you in, what, 15 minutes? I'm looking at Sam. 15 minutes. Right, see you then. If you're wondering, Carl's had special treatment. He's got a little lem sip on the go. <laughs>
<laughs> um, right, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's get straight back to it. And Jordan Henderson, Adam Crafton, um, has become a lightning rod for this entire situation that we're in. You uh, interviewed him, along with David Ornstein yeah. as well. What was that process like, and, and what were your takeaways from it? Yeah, well, I suppose just give, in case anyone doesn't have the, the context to it, over the last, I suppose, 10 years or so, we've seen this annual Rainbow Laces campaign across sport, uh, football in particular, where you've seen, so, probably fair to say, like a small number, actually, of Premier League footballers talk in some way engagingly around uh, LGBT rights and the experiences of LGBT people in football. Um, and Jordan Henderson, I don't know whether he necessarily put himself front and center of that, but he was prepared to engage more heavily than many other players had been prepared to be. So you'd see a lot of people, I mean, a lot of the players didn't even wear laces at all. And a lot of players might have done, you know, uh, one minute for the club website or put their name to a you know a statement on a club website i remember being told a story a few years ago by um kick it out wanted to do a sort of a one minute video where they'd have a word from each player that would make a sentence so it'd have like one player say i am against homophobia and they were struggling even to get players to say one word that would go into that whole segment so that gives an idea of the kind of how few people are engaging. So John Henderson becomes quite well known for that. Um, and then he goes to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so uh, that therefore creates all these accusations of, of hypocrisy, of you're prepared to promote this thing, you wanted to gain, I suppose, improve your reputation in some ways by engaging with this, with this issue. And then a sum of money's come along from a very, very wealthy state that criminalizes LGBT people, and you've, you've gone there and not really explained it. So um, we were approached by, uh, by Jordan Henderson um, and a representative who wanted to do an interview. And they wanted to do an interview with, I think, also someone who was from the LGBT community like myself, but also uh, my colleague David Ornstein was there as well. And you know, we, we spent about an hour with him at his home. and. He answered everything that he was asked. Um, he received a huge amount of criticism, I think it's fair to say, for some of his answers. Equally, I would also say, he's probably the only player that's gone to Saudi Arabia that's really taken any questions, like like those kind of questions. So that, that was how it all played out, really. Did it change your feelings around it per, from a personal perspective? Um, <laughs> Because you, you also went to Qatar and, and yeah, yeah, witnessed... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, look, Jordan's, Jordan's answers were very, very much what I expected them to be. So the kind of answers that he gave were things like, you know, I want to go and I want to help there to be a change. So I'd kind of... What, before these kind of interviews, you can almost roadmap a little bit so that you have your second question, your third question, your fourth question, your fifth question. And actually because we've had some of these conversations around sports washing over the years, you actually know what the first answer is going to be. It's going to be, well, the only way you can change things is through engagement, right? So follow-up to that is then, okay, so the Jordan Hen and he says, I'm not going to change who I am. So I said, okay, well, the Jordan Henderson, who we know in Liverpool, wears a rainbow captain's armband and rainbow laces. And so are you going to go there and do that? Because that would be a pretty... S actually, although some people would say it's a pretty small thing, in that climate, a pretty significant thing. And he said, oh, I'd be open to that, but also I'm not going to do anything that offends the culture. So it's like, okay, so you are changed slightly. And then also when he joined uh, his club, Al Etifak, they did an announcement interview where they did a collage of pictures from his career. And actually one of the pictures was a rainbow armband. And in this video, they'd grade it out. So it was almost, I said to him, like, you basically, you know, you're saying this is who you are, but actually this club that are paying you loads of money are saying, no, we want a slightly manicured version of that. So we had that, that conversation, um, and then he, you know, he sort of kept doubling down on this culture thing. And I'd heard a lot about in Qatar of, you know, basically you're almost 
discriminating in your, I am the one discriminating by saying it's wrong to criminalize gay people because it is insulting to an interpretation of the religion that you may have in Qatar or Saudi Arabia according to the law. So George Jordan is then saying, well, it's the culture, like you can't just go there and offend people. And I said, okay, but when I think about culture, I think about museums, food, uh, music, socializing, cinema, art. When you talk about sexuality, you're talking about the way people are born. So that's not culture, right? You can have cultures within, you can have gay culture, but that's different to um, the idea of sexuality being a culture. And I think it was kind of after that moment, and we actually we, we presented the interview as a transcript, and I think after that, he just the, we did just write long pause, because <laughs> he I think for him, that was kind of a slight moment of, okay, this is a lot harder to explain. Now, my, my feeling around having spent time with him is that he is probably someone who was completely genuine at the time of saying what he said. You know, all the things he was saying around, you know, I don't want any teammates who I play with at Liverpool to feel as though they can't belong. I'd support them, I'd encourage them. I want fans who come to the stadium to feel safe. Um, I think he was completely genuine in what he was saying there. And then, a, and then an opportunity came along at a stage in his career where he was offered a huge amount of money and he's probably thought, and he said, you know, he says this isn't the case, but I still, this is still my feeling on it. You know, he is still, um, my, I look at it and think, you're just thinking, two years in Saudi, it's a huge amount of money, sort this generation of Hendersons out, the next four generations of Hendersons out, and look, who, how many others in that position can honestly say they wouldn't do the same thing in their own industry and take the same decision? So that was the way I came about it, that he was someone who meant well, but had almost got in too deep and was trying to still really be loved by everyone, right? He wanted the acceptance from the new place he's going to, but he also wanted those who had, I suppose, appreciated his allyship previously to still feel exactly the same way about him, which was just never going to happen. Just based on what you've just heard from Adam there, just a quick show of hands. Who here would, let's say it was two years in Saudi, who here would raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'd do the same thing as Jordan Henderson. Okay. Not quite a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the, the, the... To be clear, I'm not, saying I, I'm not saying I would. I'm saying, yeah. I don't know, I feel like a lot of people would yeah. do that. Yeah, I, I'm not I sure I this is the most fair yeah. reflection yeah. of society. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think... But he right. was he was being offered a substantial amount more than he was earning, um, and can you? Yeah, no, no. I'm no, not. I'm not but, but that that you know that has to play a part but, in his but, thinking. But, I'm but, not but, defending but no, it. No, no, no. But, but Simon, the problem with that actually is throughout the interview he denied that money was at all yeah, a motivation. No, well, but so so his argument was actually I'm going to grow the grow the game and unfortunately I think the attendances at the moment are about seven hundred. No, no, right. the, I mean, the, 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 the point that I was sorry, the point that I was I was going to make was clearly um it's hypocritical to do what yeah. he did. Um but the response to that is, well, do you keep your head down? Mm. Like, don't get involved, don't say anything, don't promote any anything, because you never know at some point in the, you know, in, in the far future whether something's going to happen in your career that you think, well, I might have to kind of contradict myself here, and the, the pylon that's going to come at me means that I prefer to keep my mouth shut. And the world's not perfect, is it? So if he did mean what he said, it would be great if he had the courage of his convictions, but he didn't. And like you say, then do, do you think other it's people... Carl, do you think, think it's that? substantially different to go and play in the Saudi Pro League to being... So, for example, Jordan Henderson's now getting booed when he plays for England. Is it substantially different to be Phil Foden being paid, you could say, by, uh, well through a fund that would be linked to a regime that criminalises gay people, to Kieran Trippier, who plays at Newcastle, to Harry Kane, who nearly joined Man City. I do. Uh, is it subs why I is it do. substantially I know different? I do, and this is due to this very, very... Mo there was a fantastic piece in the Atlantic and the New York Times about this, and this was around 2016, about how 
the modern age of conversation and politics is very much focused on saying you're a hypocrite yeah. than it is on saying what you're doing is bad. And Henderson was particularly painful because what we're describing here is a person who his entire footballing career was one built on hard work, on honesty, and on helping out people who needed your help, who needed more help than you. And he built that all up. And then the moment someone offered a certain number, it wasn't that anymore. So he became, in many people's eyes, a hypocrite. We had a fantastic piece from Keith O'Neill saying, you basically just sold us all out and you were a hypocrite. Whereas I look at someone like Odio Igalo, who signed for a Saudi Arabian club and then asked him why, and he went, oh, brother, I'm playing football for money. This is not about this. And there's been two or three uh, Muslim football players, uh, one who have gone, I'm going here because culturally, it, you know, I'm going to a Muslim country to play football. This is a cleaner fit to what I'm doing. Uh, Kula Bali did a very interesting interview where he said, I'm going to Saudi Arabia because they're giving me such a large amount of money that I can now build hospitals and villages and pay for roads back home in Senegal. And those football players are not getting anywhere near the pile that Jordan Henderson's getting. So it's not so much Jordan Henderson is going to Saudi Arabia is wrong. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I think that's a different argument. It's everything Jordan Henderson did for basically since 2016 yeah. about how he conducted his character is incongruous to going to Saudi Arabia. And we talk about life changing sums of money. How much money do you need? Oh, I'm going to earn all this money so my grandchildren don't have to suffer the monogamy of work. Again, <laughs> Jordan Henderson's entire career has, all been, has been entirely about grafting. He is not the most talented football player. He's not the most intelligent football player. He's not the quickest football player. His entire thing and the reason why he's the captain is you graft. When it's really hard, you graft. So for him to go, eh, I want to take Saudi money so my family doesn't have to graft? You're not making Hendersons. You're making something that breaks like a family chain of everything. And that's why the Henderson thing was, was really hurtful. And you talk about menu roadmap. Mm. Uh, an interview, like I, I call it a flowchart, right? You talk to someone about wh why are you going to this country? And we, see what we saw it with Live Golf, when Live Golf yeah. was bought by yeah. Saudi Arabia. They went, well, I'm going to Saudi Arabia to promote the game of golf yeah. and to bring golf to, to, and bring the power of golf. We saw this with the apartheid tours in cricket and in rugby, going, we're going over to South Africa, and yeah, okay, they've got apartheid, but hopefully through the power of sport, we can change things. And it's all a fiction, always a fiction. We all know that if you enter a toxic, um, really sorry for saying the word toxic here. You ever, if you enter a toxic environment, you are more likely to become a toxic person than you are able to make that place less toxic. Jordan Henderson going to Saudi Arabia is more like he's going to be changed by the Saudi Arabian environment than he is to change that. And he may believe in his heart of hearts that going to Saudi Arabia, he's going to be able to influence the game in subtle, imperceptible ways to us bigoted Westerners who are wagging our fingers. But what's already happened is what Adam's described. He became changed by it already by saying, I'm not actually going to wear the laces. There was one answer in there he gave that stuck in my head was he said, well, I've, I've done my, he basically said, worse effect, I've done my bit. I wore the laces. I wore, I, wore, I wore the armband. I used to talk to LGBT England fans. Like, why are you still yelling at me? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, yelling at you because you've broken the bond you had with this group of people that relied on you to protect them, essentially. And if you were going to go to Saudi Arabia to, for work, no problem. Thank you for your candor. But I have a friend who is very good at cybersecurity. Uh, sometimes that means the UN sends them over to certain countries and goes, please make sure that election is not going to be tampered on. And sometimes that means certain people around the world go, do you mind coming over to this country and checking up on these potential dissidents? And he always says to me, everyone in this world has a number that if someone goes, I'm going to give you this much, you just have to stop doing this, you'll say yes. The idea, and what you should always try and do, is make sure, one, you know what your number is. Everyone's got that number. I always call it the, if the lottery reaches that thing, do you buy a ticket? I know, if the Euro Millions hits 50 million, I'm probably going to buy a ticket. Which means if someone comes along and goes, do you want 50 million, Carl, to do this? Oh, I, I got a turnaround. And he always said, if you know, know your number, and then make sure you are never in the room when they offer you that number, because you don't know if you're going to put your hand on the money or if you're going to turn away. Jordan Henderson had a number clearly. And eventually, in that conversation with Liverpool about contract extension, or this, or this, or this, that number wasn't reached. And then someone came along and went, here's your number. And Henderson himself still doesn't understand that this club bought him because not only did they think he was an important player, not only did he think he'd put headlines in there, but also it's, it's a moral victory for the Saudi Arabian League. It, it's from now on, no matter what we do and talk about, well, you shouldn't watch the Saudi Pro League or do this, someone gets to go, well, Jordan Henderson went, what's the problem?
that's why he's paid so much money. It's, it's the useful idiot problem. <laughs> Let's think forward. 2034, um, pretty sure it's going to be Saudi Arabia for the World Cup, given that they were the only bidders. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like in this discourse, Molly, that Saudi Arabia are, are the big bad. You know, mm. we've, we've got the Newcastle takeover and various issues going on. Geopolitically, though, where the Saudi sit with the UK? Yeah, it's a very fun league table, isn't it, of who's the worst behaved on the international stage at the moment. Um, I mean, there are clearly big discrepancies between the way that we operate in the UK and the way that we operate in Saudi Arabia. I think possibly the more pertinent question is about whether or not those two things are aligning or moving further apart. And that's kind of the context that this plays out yeah. in. Um, so clearly, Saudi's treatment of LGBT plus people, not what we would expect in the UK. Um, they have very repressive laws. They still have the death penalty, but then also so do the US. Um, and recently, they have been saying, at least proclaiming, um, that they are improving women's rights dramatically, which has been one of the long-standing criticisms um, in the country. Um, in 2019, women got passports, so don't say that nothing ever, ever changes, um, and were then able to travel without male permission. So I think you have to see all of the context of what we're talking about not really with the view of where we are now, but yeah. really where people want to be. And I think in that sense, there's clearly, you know, MBS is leading this sort of modernization program. And I think the football plays a part in that. So I think we're becoming perhaps less different, but certainly there are very serious concerns. And Amnesty International came out, you know, when this yeah. um, was announced and said, this is blatant sports washing and, and um, FIFA's sort of giving a green light to all of this behavior. So I think at what point it becomes you know, changed enough that people yeah. are comfortable, I think is a is an interesting question. Uh, and MBS is Mohammed bin Salman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the sort of de facto ruler of um, Saudi. Um, Simon, with your with your BBC hat on, you, you've got to <laughs> tread lines carefully. When something like Amnesty come and say X, Y, and Z about Saudi Arabia, what's the what's the process there as far as editorially going? Whether BBC sort of run that sort of story in, in, in a criticism point point away or raising well, the issues at all? I, I, I've never been aware of an editorial decision not to run an amnesty response to something that happens in, in Saudi Arabia because they're putting their point forward and usually, you know, when we're talking about the, the World Cup, there was a statement from the Saudi government, there was a statement from the Saudi Football uh, Federation. So it, it's all about a balance, isn't it? Um, it's, it's difficult because the other thing we have to do is substantiate uh, claims. So yeah. when we're talking about, you know, people who, who died in Qatar um, constructing stadiums, we have to be very careful as the BBC on both sides, just taking it as read what amnesty say, but also what um, the Qataris say. Now, Clearly, it, sometimes it is within within the process of putting a story together in a day. Well, it's impossible to substantiate those two things. So what you have to do is put both both angles. That's the only way you can do it. But there are other other people, excellent journalists, both at the BBC and elsewhere, mm -hmm. who who go to places like yeah. Qatar and have more of an understanding of of what happens, and the same, I, I assume, may be that the laws of getting into the country are slightly different, but I, I assume they will do the same with Saudi Arabia. It's a very difficult situation. Equally, FIFA, going back to the point about Qatar, and, and Saudi Arabia is the same kind of thing. If, if FIFA weren't prepared for all the, the criticism that comes from the LGBT community, from people who want to drink alcohol, from people who feel as though they're having their freedoms impinged, well, don't take major events like the World Cup to those countries. But talking about hitting the, hitting the number, I assume, might be wrong, but I assume Australia believe that the number is being hit 
by being offered the Asia Cup, which Saudi Arabia are clearly going to be influential in the award of that tournament, and also the Club World Cup with FIFA's tournament, so they will decide. It doesn't even go to a like bidding process, it's just selected. So I assume that the hosting of those two tournaments hits the number that allows Australia to feel comfortable about stepping back and not entering a, a vote that they presume couldn't win anyway and yeah. allowing Saudi Arabia to hit host the World Cup? A very difficult, uncomfortable conversation in that world tournaments are too expensive. You, to, have, uh, to have a World Cup, a 32-team World Cup, or a 40s, well, 40, yeah. however many World Cup, <laughs> yeah. you need X amount of stadiums, you need this much infrastructure, you need this much. So the only countries that can currently hold a World Cup tomorrow, you know, we said this off when Blatter was arrested, was Britain can hold a World Cup tomorrow. Britain can hold a tournament, France can hold the current footballing super, traditional superpowers. Yeah. Now Infantino's argument has always been, we've got to take football around the world to, to show the power of football, wink, wink. He's doing what he's doing is what Havelange used to do when he was the FIFA president, what Blatter used to do, where he realized there's way more voting box and people to vote him in as the FIFA president in Africa, in, ta in the Middle East and these countries. And if he takes the tournament there, he secures all the votes and he gets to be essentially the god emperor of football. But, but the, problem, the problem with that, when we talk about, you know, if the aim is to grow the game, mm -hmm. well, we're taking the World Cup. <laughs> Where's the World Cup just been? Qatar. So we're, we're growing the game by taking the World Cup five kilometers down the road to Saudi Arabia. Loads of Saudis went to the World Cup in Qatar. Probably more Saudis went to the World Cup in Qatar than Qataris, because most of the Qataris came to London. We also have this very, some very serious conversation about how, because World Cups are so expensive, a lot of people native to the countries don't want World Cups. If you yeah. look at Morocco's bid, a lot of Moroccans are saying, do not bring the World Cup here. We don't want to have all these white elephant football stadiums. Yeah. Uh, you know, this massive, massive push for more cars, more wider motorways, and we, want, and we need, actually, we need wells, we need wa water, we yeah. need fertilizer. So that, yeah, that's why Morocco sort of pulled out of the 2026 bit. Yeah. Now, in front, you know, we talk about securing votes. We're talking right now where the African Football League has just launched, and this is Infantino's baby project. He's not quite an African Super League, but it's actually this, and he's got his, the CAF president is basically a patsy for Infantino. Now, that tournament had no sponsors up until two weeks before it was launched. And the sponsors were Visit Rwanda and Visit Saudi. Visit Saudi, not too long ago, signed a very, very large agreement with CAF, so sort of the UEFA of Africa, basically saying, could you support our World Cup bids and we will pay for football stadiums, trains, infrastructure that you want. And that's the agreement there. CAF's gone, no worries. Visit Rwanda is another version of sports washing, right? You see it on Arsenal shirts, you see it on all these other shirts. The African Football the League Brit tournament. See the British right Home now. Office. Yeah, <laughs> the African Football League tournament had a team, had a Tanzanian team in there, and they are not wearing Briz Visit Rwanda on their shirt because Rwanda and Tanzania are in the middle of a proxy war, and this is how football becomes incredibly complicated. Inserted all these geopolitical projects because you've got millionaires or billionaires who are able to change reality on essentially a whim. The way I always yeah. describe it is, if we go to London we will probably ask a mate to sleep on their sofa or we'll go for a cheap hotel. If a football player like Phil Foden goes to London, he'll stay in a nice hotel. If a billionaire is cold, he can get in a private jet and go somewhere else. Like These people in charge of football treat winter as a choice. And we are trying to work out what they're planning next. And honestly, the answer is you don't know what they're planning next. One day they'll see a shinier car and go, I don't want to do this, I want to do F1 instead. Yeah, I, I think there's also, there's some very simple reasons why FIFA like Saudi as an idea. Something FIFA are discovering at the moment, because the next World Cup, the next men's World Cup is in the USA, Canada, and Mexico. And FIFA are discovering democracy. And that's, that's a problem for them, because <laughs> one, of, one of the major issues that comes around with that is you have major costs when it comes to renting stadiums, right? Renting training facilities. Because what they're seeing now if you take the World Cup to a city like New York or LA or the San Francisco Bay Area, okay, it's a nice week for New York's economy, but no one's going to start thinking differently of New York as a result of having Argentina against England in the group stage of a World Cup, right? <laughs> like, that's just, it, New York stands on its own two feet. And as a result of that, FIFA have become very used to basically saying to cities, 
we're going to take over for, the, for, for a couple of months before a, start, uh, before a tournament starts. We're going to impose huge sort of fan zones, revenue sharing agreement. We'll take most of that. Sponsorship, we'll take care of that. And you've got these, these Americans who own the stadiums, we're seeing this in LA in particular at the moment, who are basically just looking at this and saying, well, you're projecting that you're going to make $13 billion out of this World Cup. Where's our share? Mm. What are we getting? And why is this more valuable to us than having Taylor Swift do a concert? Right, which might sound weird and funny to us, but actually to them, the Americans are looking at this and just saying, you're, we don't need you maybe as much as actually FIFA needs America, right, to grow the game and all of that kind of stuff. So that's one thing that the Saudis do give them. You know, you're going to have a lot of state-funded facilities, state-funded rentals that cuts those costs. There'll be less commercial crossover, I would think, as well. And what you'll also see over the next 11 years is Saudis sponsoring a huge amount of things related to football, <coughs> related to FIFA, all of which gets reinvested into, fee into either football ecosystem or to FIFA, which means FIFA revenues get bigger, which means there's more money to give to member associations, which means more people are happy with Gianni Infantino, which means when the next vote comes along, who's more likely to be the president? Gianni Infantino. And then you, you're also talking about geopolitics, but there's also a political angle between FIFA and UEFA because yes. FIFA want good Saudi teams because then they want a Club World Cup because they want a, a rival to the Champions League. That's the way yeah. that it goes. If, if there's no teams other than the European teams that are any good to go into the Club World Cup, well, what's the point of the competition? So it suits them to have good teams in Saudi Arabia. Uh, to jump we, in. we are going to go to a Q and A in a moment, but I just want to give you a, a question before we do. Uh, and this isn't shamelessly to plug my cycling podcast, but I do have one. And one of the biggest teams, Jumbo Visma, uh, have just announced a new sponsor. You know, Jumbo were a, a supermarket, and Visma are a, uh, an IT company. It's basically the equivalent of if it was UK, it'd be Asda Amstrad. Okay, so you've got mm. them. You've got Sudal Quickstep, who are uh, the Europe's largest um, like sealant, like the bathroom sealant. A quick step of uh, a flooring. The biggest rivals are UA Team UAE Emirates and Bahrain Victorious. And what these cycling teams are realizing is that without these massive investments, the sport can't survive anymore. Is this the way that football might go? Without this, you know, we're calling it soft power, we're calling it investment. You know, the way things are going, all this money coming in, can we survive without it? I, th I think there's. And a if that was your question, by the way, I'm sorry that I've taken <laughs> it from you. Yeah. No, I. Th I think it's an interesting point. I think it's, like, it's one of the arguments that rivals of Manchester City have made for the last 10, 15 years is how are we meant to compete mm. if, as, is as has been alleged and denied by Manchester City, that you have this sponsorship coming into the club, disqu uh, sorry, equity to coming into the club disguised as sponsorship, which obviously City have always denied, um, but you have these, these charges. So the idea is, well, how can a club compete? other clubs compete with that. Get, gets United's recruitment team to go to City. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so <laughs> as, but, but, you, but you make a good point, right? Man United have actually spent as much, if, yeah. not, if not more, right? So they can compete. Um, the problem is if you then get like two, or two, three, four of the, I mean, look, we're never gonna, there's not gonna be more than four, five sovereign wealth funds owning football clubs. They just aren't, you know, unless Norway gets involved, bring back Oli. Um, to Man United, <laughs> um, that's going to be very unlikely. Um, so I think it's more just about, and I think this is a stage football is getting to anyway, just getting those fin that financial fair play correct and getting mm. those controls. And actually, if you look at what Newcastle have done since their takeover, they've spent money, but they've not, you know, they've not done what they could have done. You know, when you look at what the Saudi Pro League's done, and when you look at what they did with Live Golf and you know, offering Tiger Woods nine figures. Like, they've not disrupted it in that way. They've just basically done it through having a plan and good coaching and staying within financial fair play. Now, you can agree or disagree whether you want the Saudis to even own a football club in the first place. But I think if you're at that stage where clubs are broadly acting within their means, then I, don't, I think, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. You can't just turn around to Man City now and say, get out. I, I always get frustrated when people say the genie's out the bottom or bottle or the horse is bolted in that... But you're a, you're a dreamer. I am a dreamer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a Manchester United fan. So I, I remember I remember Barcelona '99. So I've only been in this industry for a couple of years, but 
everything I've learned in this industry is nothing is inevitable until you treat it as inevitable. So is, my friend Billy often says, you look at football, you look at WWE, you look at a lot of these sports that have, work, have traditional working class backgrounds and now how they are constantly going, instead of asking 100 people for $1, they're now going to very, very moneyed people around the world saying, please give me 2 billion. So we've all sort of, the crowd sort of become the modern court jester. And it's this, they can't buy you unless you agree to it. And this is why sports washing is hard and insidious, because then you have, you've said but, we've said maybe, we've said however, we've talked about the grayness. Football can survive without this. We just need to have more of a moral backbone. And that's really hard, but we've done it before. We, football fans helped stop the Super League. There was that one time where they tried to put a bunch of Premier League games behind pay-per-view and we all went, no. It, it, the difficulty is getting enough football fans to put aside their City versus United, Liverpool versus whatever, to put that enough to the side and realise actually there's billions of us and we all like football and we can all like, we know where Infantino lives. So, <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's open it up to some questions. Uh, put your hand up and uh, Sam will come over and uh, wave a mic in your face. We know you don't need the mic, by the way. <laughs> I'll take um, can I just say, Adam, thank you so much for that interview, John Henderson, because I think you really went and asked all those questions um, and you didn't let him get away with, like, his, some of his answers, like the pre-prepared things, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, kind of talking about, so Gareth um, Southgate has obviously come out and supported Henderson. Harry Maguire said, you're not a real England fan if you boo Jordan Henderson. And neither have kind of been really drawn into why they're doing that. Do you think it's just they don't want to get into that bigger conversation? Or are they just purely being ignorant and just kind of in their own bubble? Like, you know, we're football fans, this is what we do. A bit like what Southgate alluded, yeah. the British government's already getting in with Saudi Arabia. And I mean, we are all like a tourist, we're like Disneyland, aren't we really, yeah. to a lot of the world, England? Because yeah. they like to see our pretty ter heritage and culture, like the Cotswolds and stuff. Um, and we've kind of let that happen, but in football we're like, oh no. So yeah, do you think they're just in their own bubble or is it? No, I, I think it's probably actually more simple than that. Um, thank you for your point in the first place. Um, I think it's more simple. I think it's just, they know this guy well. They have experience playing with him, coaching him, seeing him getting booed onto a football pitch and just in their dressing room world, they're just thinking that's not very nice. And I think that's where a lot of that comes from. I think Southgate's also thinking, I'm speculating here, you know, he may be thinking about what he does after it, you know, what's he going to do after England? And is he going to create a situation for himself where he says Saudi Arabia is this huge problem and then he gets offered a job in 18 months' time and he hits that number, right? Or something like, you know, if he starts really criticizing Saudi Arabia, then some people will follow that up and say, well, what about Kieran Trippier and what about Callum Wilson? And, what if Harry Kane signs for Newcastle next summer? So I think he's seeing a broader picture of that. And I think also, that it, you know, I don't like to use this argument around the, Brit you know, the, the way the British government has taken Saudi money. But when the Newcastle takeover was going on, I mean, we've reported sort of the emails that were going on between the British Foreign Office and the British Embassy um, in, Qatar, in, sorry, in Saudi Arabia. And you had number 10, Downing Street, describing the possibility that this takeover doesn't happen as an immediate risk, those were their words, to relations between Britain and Saudi Arabia, trying to get this interlocutor from number 10 to, to try and make it happen, to massage it. Now, number 10 would always say, oh, we won't, put, you know, we won't tell people what to do, but it was very, very clear what the position of the British government is, and look, ultimately, the FA, yeah, okay, it stands on its own two feet, but let's not forget who his president is, right? President's Prince William. It's, it's a, you know, talk about soft power, right? You know, there is, there is a, <laughs> yeah. You know, there is, a, a, it's not a state representative thing, but it is, I don't think it's ever going to deviate so much from the broad position of the British government, which is why I also, I think, once they got to Qatar, they didn't have very much to say, I think. I think also the Premier League is one of the great UK exports. Only. So, well, yeah, <laughs> you could argue, yeah. So you could argue that the government would, would not be wanting 
the Premier League to do anything that would jeopardise one of its relations because the Premier League has enough power yeah. to be able to do that if it said no. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Got one over there. We've got a gent as well. Around them. Uh, can I actually follow that last one up? If um, you know, Saudi and Qatar have bought the World Cup, at what point are they just going to buy the Premier League and run it however they fancy? Is it using buy the competition? Yeah. Like, li like Live Golf has sort of taken yeah. over the PGA. And just you know, get a global league, get City United playing around the world because it suits their interests. What's yeah. to stop them doing it? I think... I, I don't see a world where they buy the whole league per se because at the moment it is the way the Premier League works it's a member owned so, so they'd have to buy I suppose 14 clubs and then because you need 14 votes to make it happen now it's possible I think that they could try and buy the Champions League or something like that maybe or, or set or do what they did with Live Golf right and actually set up uh, I don't know I'm trying to think of a, a name rival, the, Champions, the Champions yeah. Trophy get Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, a couple of the big English teams in, and then UEFA will think, oh, well, we have to get into, into bed with it in some we way. Had, that was super I think that's one but reason. Just, just, sorry, just to finish, what, just on what you were saying around taking the, the games around the world, I think that will happen. I don't think it will be something that happens all the time, but I think if football clubs continue to talk about global fan bases, monetizing the digital fan, they're obsessed now with unlocking value in, app, in, in the app, right? Like, every, like pretty much every business is. And one of the best ways to do that is actually, you know, at the moment, Man, you know, Manchester United will have a huge fan base in Asia, in, in the US, and what they really get is one game, playing devil's advocate, is maybe one pre-season game every three or four years. Now, some people say that's how it should be because the team's from Manchester, and a lot of fans even in Asia will think, yeah, I support Manchester because it's Manchester. But at some point, I think there will be more conversation about what meaningful product can we give to that global fan base. And I think that will lead to more games going abroad. I think the, further abroad. I think the purchase outright won't happen because it's too obvious. And there's, there's a smart way of outlining this, but one of the intelligent or crafty things they did with the Saudi product it was it wasn't just one team Piff bought four and said we're going to buy we're going to give essentially this money tap to four clubs and they can go off and spend what they want so now the Saudi Pro League has competition within the league instead of one team being the Harlem Globetrotters and that's how you get people to take them more seriously because it's not a done deal that Ronaldo's team's going to win because Neymar's team might do something and the idea very often when you sports wash is you don't make it so obvious what you're doing. You don't have one point of focus. Um, this is why we, we're, when we're talking and Francis Nagano f just for Tyson Fury and they're calling that Riyadh season. And Riyadh season is not just boxing matches. Yeah. You have a little bit of everything in there to make it interesting to many different people. And I think if you just buy the Premier League, then, okay, you've got the Premier League. Now what? I think, I think there's also if you watch where the Club World Cup goes, we don't know like, what the world's going to look like in 20, 30 years' time. But I've said FIFA, it suits FIFA to have good Saudi teams, but you can manipulate the way that the Club World Cup operates. And if you've already got 16 European teams in there, well, we know how... F uh, no, 12 European teams. We know how four of them yeah. are getting in by winning the Champions League. So City are in and Chelsea are in, Real Madrid are in. Well, I, I think there'll be a, a method by which the other eight come in uh, that we'll see Barcelona and, well, clearly another English team. Barcelona and, and Real Madrid now playing the Super Cup in yeah. Saudi Arabia no. and it's two legs so and blah, 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 blah. But as time goes on, the rules will be nip manipulated because let's face it, if you're talking about the Premier League, no broadcasters wanting to Burnley and Sheffield United, are they? No. They're wanting Liverpool and Man United. They're wanting 
City against Arsenal, the, the one in the big team. So that's not lost on people like FIFA. Sorry, our host um, is a Burnley fan. <laughs> <laughs> Another really good example is is a, a failed experiment in sports washing, which is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has a sovereign wealth fund. Azerbaijan spent a lot of money around about 2014, 15, 16 to make Baku a thing. You remember the 2016 Champions League final? Mm. Europa League final, Chelsea versus Arsenal. And all these Arsenal fans go, oh, well, I don't know how to get to Azerbaijan. I didn't realize Azerbaijan didn't have Euros. And Azerbaijan did a really big push to make that football a thing. They also, they basically invented a form of the Olympic Games for yeah. one year. It was called the European Games. It happened in 20, I want to say 2019. And it was one and done because they thought, we'll have a version of the Olympic Games. We'll be loads of Azerbaijan money. We've paid this fantastic architect to build stadiums. And it just, it didn't catch fire because they went too obvious. The, the key to sports washing, again, is you don't realize it's sports washing. So buying stuff outright doesn't quite work. We are virtually out of time. Just before we do wrap up, um, I've not outed myself of my team I support, which is Berry, so I know more than anyone. You know, for a while, I constantly play this double think of working in sport, working in football, talking about the EFL. You know, we love the EFL. Simultaneously, you kicked my football club out of the league, and now we're in Division 9. <laughs> so uh, I'm constantly wrestling with this. But what about the fan like me who wants to go to Gig Lane? I wasn't able to get there. Now I can. I don't want to. It's not necessarily me, but I don't want to engage with any of this. I just want to enjoy the football. Is that a legitimate place to be? Is that the right place to be, Molly? Well, there's a quick fire answer for yeah. the end, by the way. We've run out of time, boy. I think in my experience covering, because I'm not a sports journalist, if that hasn't come across, um, I cover foreign affairs and, and the global side of this and I think I personally hope that we can see more and more engagement in the things that we use every day be that the things that we consume for fun or the food we eat or the products that we buy or the clothes that we wear I think that we're in an era where information is more and more accessible and personally I hope people use that and that translates into the, the decisions that they make. I'm never going to have a pop at somebody for not you know, making the most ethical-led decision on, on everything. These are miserable times that we live in. But I do hope as information becomes more readily available, we start to include a more holistic approach in all the stuff we consume, including football, personally. Yeah. I would, I would just never tell a person how they should be spending their Saturday, right? Like, if, if someone wants to go and watch whoever they want to watch, you know, in, in, in a football match with their kid and have a nice day out. I, I just, I struggle, I struggle, I think, when, whenever I see people sort of insisting that people should think this or should think that or should do this or should do that. Everyone's got their own choice to make with it. You know, we as, you know, we, we as journalists sometimes take a lot of heat because it's our job to tell these stories, right? And it doesn't, you know, what I would never do is say, you have to do this as a result of this information. It's just about telling people things, and if people want to read them, great. If people want to steer their lives by them, don't do it too often. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's difficult. I also think it's difficult, you know, when we start saying to sort of, you know, Newcastle fans who have had a rubbish 20 odd years, you know, it's not being, sometimes they make out it's being, you know, Berry. And it's, it's, you know, it's not. <laughs> Sorry, Sonny. Right? It's not. It's been bottom half of the Premier League and a couple of promotions. But if they're having a lot more fun as a result of this investment, then I find it very hard to begrudge people from, 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 enjoying, from enjoying that. I don't think it necessarily means they buy into everything mm. that goes into creating that product. Um, equally, so you asked for quick fire. Um, <laughs> They can't, yeah, they, can't, <laughs> they can't simultaneously hold the position that we did everything possible to get Mike Ashley out, mm. and that shows fan power, mm. right? So that's the kind of contradiction of it. All of a sudden, when sovereign wealth funds arrive and our team's successful, we are powerless. The football fan can't do anything about it. What do you want us to do? But when it's you know, the Glazers or mm. Mike Ashley, fans can make change, right? Try and keep it yeah. short. <laughs> what I would say about Berry was Berry Berry were booted out of the EFL because the guy who owned it didn't pay his his bills, and that that you know that goes back to whether people like that should be allowed to own football clubs, which gets us down another kind of argument. I I would agree 
With Adam, I, I think the information is out there for everybody. It's up to any individual whether they want to engage with it, how much they want to engage with it, whether they just want to turn up and watch their team play and, and go home. That is up to them. The information is there if they want it. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. I think at some point, now again, I'm not going to tell you what to do on a Saturday. You will need to do something outside of work. But I do, in a very personal experience, my now what I try and do is just listen to the voice at the back of my head. So I, I really liked Kanye West when I was growing up. And I listened to all of his albums and it was great. And then it just became a very obvious point in my life where I can't listen to these albums anymore. And then I kept listening to it and kept making excuses. And then I got to another point where I went, no, I've got to put these things down. And then I, I got to a point where I went, you have to put it down. And then I went, well, I'm going to put it down. I'm also going to donate some money to a charity that is affected by the things Kanye West does. Uh, and I've got you know, I've one of my mentors, same thing with Eric Clapton. Um, when WWE first went to Saudi Arabia and the female wrestlers weren't allowed to wrestle, I really wanted to watch it. I also have a friend who's just like, I'm not going to watch that because it, it's morally wrong. And I went, you're correct. So then I donate money to another charity. And my view now is when it gets difficult and you can't quite let go, can you do karmic offsetting? I uh, know that. I uh, know that's like a, a riddle. We've got it to a whole of a podcast. Sorry, 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 we? sorry Carl. Just, 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 uh, just on Kanye. Just to go full circle with what you said before. Um, I was in a piano bar in New Orleans this summer, and there was a few. There was a, guy, a few guys there who were asking the guy on the piano, "Can you play this Kanye song?" And this guy was Jewish. He was like, "No, no." He said, "Loads of anti-Semitic things. I'm not. I don't want to play that song." So they offer ten dollars. Says no. Offers twenty dollars. Says no. They say, what about 50? Says no. Then they hit the number. And so it's not just, it's not just football where that <laughs> happens. Uh, Molly, I'll give you a last word. I had a question which I was wondering on uh, your opinions about. I'm, look I'm looking at Sam, by the way. Yeah, he's, sorry, he's Sam, I'll make it so quick. Three minutes, <laughs> right, that's a minute each. Um, and I wonder, you know, coming back to the sort of fundamental theme here, soft power in football, particularly sports washing, has it worked? Does it work? Because I've spoken to some people who've said, we weren't talking about Qatar before any of this. And it comes back to your point about the fact that Qatar could at the moment be like a world hero for it, the role that it's playing. Are people sometimes putting themselves in lights that they don't want to be in? And actually, can it hit your, can it hit your reputation in the other way? I have no opinion on this, by the way. It's just something that's... Sports washing works, right? Because again, it, you're buying... So Bobby Robson once did a great thing about what a football club is, and he essentially said it's the collective store of memory from thousands, if not millions, of people. Now, if, when Saudi Arabia comes buys Newcastle, they buy that collective store of memory. So mm. no matter what you do, if you tweet right now, Saudi Arabian ownership is bad, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cop for it. Because it works. Yes, there are. It's, it's that old quote, I don't know how... President you know, Nixon won the election. None of my friends voted for him over brunch. There are a lot of people who think that, you know, what Qatar did in building stadiums, what Saudi Arabia do is very, very bad. There is the other person out there who perhaps doesn't know or perhaps doesn't care. And, th and there are other people going, well, I benefit from this anyway, and the world's going to pot anyway. Sports washing unfortunately works. Soft power unfortunately works. Because if it didn't, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you pay your license. We're right back to where we started. We are right back to where we started. The only thing I'd say, Carl, is like my experience in Qatar and also dealing with Saudis as well, they don't think they have things to cleanse, mostly. Oh, th th there, there is no, it's not like they're sat mm. there thinking, God, we're the worst society ever. <laughs> and, if we, and if we just buy Man United, maybe people will like us a bit more. It's, like, it's way more complicated than that. So... You know, th but for the public, do you think that, that people's opinions of Qatar now are better than they were or worse than they well, were before? But people like to be liked. Every individual in this room likes to be liked. You want people to say nice things. I'd like people to say nice <laughs> things about the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were friends. Um, so, like, f but that's, <laughs> but that's Sorry, the same. Right, I, I will that's answer the quickly. Yeah, the, that um, is the same. Yeah. The, what you just asked, do people think differently, mm. depends where you are in the world. Yeah, it does. Right? So I think 
I remember after the World Cup final being in the mix zone where all the players go through after the game and you had um, Hassan al Thawadi, General Secretary of the World Cup, do, going on Argentine TV, pa Paraguayan TV, Bolivian TV. And they, the, the reporters were like, this has been the best World Cup ever, singing sort of Argentina songs mm. on national television. I think the global south sees Qatar very, very differently to what is this, you know, where's the criticism? It's Australia, it's Britain, it's America, Canada, France to an extent, Germany, and, and Scandinavia. So if you're really worried about those countries, then yeah, it's an, it's an issue. But actually, how many people see it as a decisive issue in terms mm. of what they consume? You know, I think most people look at it and think, I don't like it, but it's here. Before we wrap up, just to give you a very short answer, which is going back to Berry, mm. the man who bought Berry initially, Stuart Day, mm. put in loads of money that he actually didn't have and sold car parks based off at £10,000 each. There's a whole podcast on it, don't worry. Um, but we, 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 he, was, he was lauded. He, you know, he's absolutely loved. He was singing his name. Singing his name. So imagine a country doing that. Imagine mm. a brand doing that. That's exactly what we're talking about here. It, it happens. He sold it to a man for a pound who didn't pay anything and we hated yeah. him. So it can go the other way as well. Yeah. Uh, but we are out of time. We've over time, actually, so you've got your money's worth. Um, <laughs> remember that... Uh, free tickets. Yeah, free well, <laughs> so, well, you, If you're in this room, it means as well that you've got uh, a year's uh, attendance here at the, uh, at the Football Museum, so do come back. You can see the Berry 6 Derby County nil FA Cup <laughs> football uh, up on the first floor, I think it is. And of course, we've got more events going on. Sam, what's the next event? On Monday, we've got two events. Uh, there's a lunchtime one, um, which is around um, football and the First World War um, with Dr. Alex Jackson, who's a curator here as well. And then um, we've got Amna from the Three Hijabis talking about um, the importance of an inclusive and anti-racist England team. Um, that's at three o'clock on Monday as well. So that should be really exciting. Um, more events coming up through the week. Uh, just a final note before we wrap up. Um, try and give us some feedback if you can. That's super helpful for us. Um, and also, you've got 12 months century, so yeah, do come back, see the galleries, see the exhibitions. Um, and just a massive, massive appreciation and round of applause tonight for our panel. <laughs>